All right, we're back. We're enjoying a picture of Sigmund Freud smoking a cigar, which was his ultimate downfall. Um, so moral development, before I get into Freud, uh, moral development, just to, to um, be super clear with you guys, moral development is not talking about like religious beliefs or anything like that. It's talking about how a, a person comes to determine that some behaviors are okay or right and some behaviors are not okay or are wrong that they would be um, something that I shouldn't do or that other people wouldn't approve of me doing or things like that. So how do children internalize, you know, the sort of these rules about what is, what is right and what is wrong? That's, that's what moral development is about. So Freud had something to say about that through his psychoanalytic theory. Um, he said that, okay, now you guys remember from Freudian theory that um, our id is completely unconscious and it's made up of um, these demands for uh, real basically always wanting you to be experiencing pleasure. It, you know, your id operates on the pleasure principle. Then it has the two components. One, one part of it is life affirming things like eating and drinking and having sex and other things would be housed under that life affirming side. And then there's the death affirming side where harm would be housed like aggression and, you know, biting your cuticles and other kinds of things like that would be over under Thanatos. So, um, when we talk about parents trying to control the child's id demands, what we're talking about is parents trying to um, prevent children from just always trying to make sure that they that their personal pleasure is being met, even at the expense of other people or embarrassment or other things like that. So parents are trying to control the child's id demands. And so parents, through the feedback that they give their children, really help their children to develop a super ego. Now the superego, if you recall, is the part of the personality that is partially conscious and it provides like your conscience. It tells you what you should and shouldn't do. But it is the part of your, it's just strictly telling you like what not to do. It's, it's telling you to always be a, a good person. Never indulge in your own personal satisfaction. Always be doing the right thing um, like that. So ch parents give us feedback that help us to develop that conscience and to a certain extent, this conscience that's like kind of self-sacrificing, right? Like you shouldn't be experiencing pleasure. You should always be doing the right thing. Um, now, in helping us to develop our superego, one thing that's really important for all of us to be aware of is that you can't teach a child a lesson in one trial learning. Like it's going to take years of feedback for children to ultimately internalize um, the behaviors that are okay and the behaviors that aren't. Uh, it's not, their, their superego doesn't develop overnight. It takes years to develop the superego. So you have to repeat the lessons many, many times. Um, I had a, a, a neighbor who was 17 when he became a father. Um, when he came to talk to me, he, the son was four years old. And uh, he believed that if he told his four-year-old not to do something, his four-year-old shouldn't do it. And I said, he doesn't really, you know, understand why he shouldn't do it, even though you're not there. And he said, but he's so smart. He knows better. He's just doing it to push me. And uh, so I gave the child some con Piaget and conservation tests to show the, the father, you may think he's smart, but he's still a four-year-old. Like his logic is not where you think it is. And so one of the big messages from Freudian theory is that you can't expect to teach a child something once and have it stick. You are going to have to serve as their super ego. Freud says till they're probably about eight years old, you're going to have to be their super ego. And you give them the messages, you, you give them the feedback, but you have to be present to enforce the right and the wrong because they don't have the kind of um, you know internal self-control to actually uh, listen to their own super ego because it is so powerful. They, they are dominated by their id because it's it's so well developed their super ego is just this little tiny baby that's trying to develop and it needs lots of feedback and a lot of guidance from the environment so um, freud emphasized you have to repeat it often and for years now cognitive learning theory is going to um, emphasize observational learning and modeling as ways to learn what's right and what's wrong um, with this theory it's really easy to think, oh, well, I'll show my child how to be nice and then they'll internalize that and then they'll be nice. But 
deviant models are a lot more powerful than good mo models. They stick with the child. They um, are in their memory and more accessible. Just to give you some examples from your own childhood, probably, you know, let's compare how many people remember Cruella de Vil's name and how many people remember the names of the other characters who were nice. I can't even tell. I think the, I think the maid was called Nanny. <laughs> other than that, um, I don't know their names, right? But we do know the bad person's name. Um, everybody knows Scar, although I was watching America Says the other day and uh, the prompt was when I think of the Lion King, I think of blank. And the answer was Scar and nobody generated it. But so maybe it doesn't stick in your memory perfectly, but it also could be the people's age. Um, so Scar really stands out and people remember a lot of details about him, whereas, you know, Mufasa and um, Sien, I can't remember his wife's name. Isn't that terrible? How many millions of times have I seen Lion King? I almost had it. I can't think of it, though. Or Jafar versus Aladdin. Of course, we know Aladdin's name because the movie was named after him. But Jafar's, you know, behaviors are ones that really attract our attention. And here's Aladdin trying to be good. And but Jafar catches our attention. Deviant models are more powerful than good models. They really attract attention. And I mean, if you ask an actor, they would prefer to play the deviant models, be the deviant um, roles because they're more fun. They'll they'll say it's more fun to be a bad person. Um, because in our real lives, we're not supposed to be like that. But when you're a little kid, you internalize what the deviant model is doing. Um, and so it becomes really super powerful. Now, let's go back to Piaget for a second and talk about his cognitive developmental theory. He says that just like all other kinds of cognitions, children actively develop their own morality through their interactions with the environment. They're trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong, just like they're trying to figure out everything else about how the world works. Um, so Piaget always paints the child as very, very deliberately active as they're seeking information. So the child acts on and modifies the world. They, they get feedback about the appropriateness of what they've done, you know, from their parents, from other people. And then they modify their behavior and their moral attitudes in response to the outcomes that they got. And so Piaget says they're sort of like little, you know, researchers going through life, trying to figure things out, you know, testing things. Sometimes they'll test the limits. Um, to try and figure out whether it's an okay behavior or not. Um, and so um, I thought I'd give you a little example about um, some evidence from our textbook about moral development. Um, as children grow and, and develop, they actually start to show more deviant behavior, <laughs> which is kind of contrary to what Piaget is saying. But part of why they do the deviant behaviors is because they want to find out what the environment's reaction will be. So, for example, the purple bars are the three-year-olds and the amber bars are the five-year-olds. And you'll see that in this setup where the children were told, don't peek, um, many more five-year-olds peaked than three-year-olds. Three-year-olds were more likely to follow the instructions, but still it was like half of the three-year-olds peaked. So it's not perfect, but... Um, you know, more of the, of the five-year-olds peaked. Um, now, of the peakers, the percent who said, I didn't peak, was almost 90% when they were five-year-olds, but was only like 55% when they were three-year-olds. So they, if they had done the wrong behavior as a three-year-old, they were very likely to admit it. Whereas if they did the wrong behavior as a five-year-old, they were likely to lie about it. Um, of the people who peaked, and, well, see how the percent of the children who peaked and lied about it, there you go, that's a good way of saying it, way more five-year-olds did it than three-year-olds. Um, and it, what you're seeing here is actually evidence of cognitive development. Because what we start to figure out by the age of five is that other people don't necessarily know what we know. And so we have to test that. So I know I peaked, but do you know? So maybe I'll lie to you and say, no, I didn't peek. And then if you seem to believe me, I'm like, man, I can tell lies. I can tell this person something that's not true and they'll believe me because they don't know what I know. They don't know what I've been doing. Um, so they're testing that out. It's an Im important first step in the development of morality because first off, you have to figure out that there isn't always some omniscient person, a person who knows everything, who can come in and you know punish you that you could get away with things. And now you have to decide, but will I, right? Will I do the right thing even when people aren't looking at me is basically the question. And that's really the key to morality, isn't it? Is doing the right thing even when people aren't looking, even if you wouldn't get caught. There's always these philosophical questions like, 
if you could be, if you could um, have an affair and no one would find out, would you do it? It's a great ethical question because would you do something if you knew you couldn't get in trouble for it? If you could have no repercussions, would you do the, this thing that is fundamentally wrong? Um, it's knowing that other people wouldn't know about it is the first step to realizing, okay, I have to decide for myself what's right and what's wrong because there isn't going to necessarily be somebody who's going to come in and enforce right and wrong on me. Piaget says that heteronymous morality, which is this... Um, belief that someone else is in charge of your outcomes will help to enforce your straight and narrow behavior is typically going to be displayed between the ages of five and ten. Typically when children are behaving in a way as, as if they are um, you know trying to do the right thing but it's really being governed by this belief that someone else will be the enforcer that's really common between ages five and 10. So Freud thought that by age eight, you could start to expect the superego to start exerting its, its impact on a child. Piaget thought mm, more like 10 years old, you're gonna be able to have a child who can start to make their own moral decisions without basing them on fear that you know somebody else is gonna enforce it. So about age five to 10, you see kids um, displaying heteronymous morality. Under this header of heteronymous morality, they really have very rigid moral rules. So for example, one of the things that they know makes Carilla DeVille bad is that she smokes. Like she's a bad person and she smokes. You see a person out in real life who smokes and the child may make the mistaken association that, well, here's a person out in the real world and they're smoking, they must be bad. And they probably want to kill Dalmatian puppies. <laughs> like the whole extension goes out to this person who's smoking. That has nothing to do with, you know, whether they're a good or a bad person at all. But the child says, well, this bad person smokes. Here's a person who's smoking. The, my rigid rule says smoking is associated with bad people. So this must be a bad person. And these rules don't really change for them. They think that in every circumstance, the, 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 the behavior is equally bad. Us adults recognize a lot more grayness in moral behavior that in some circumstances it might be okay to tell a miss an untruth uh, for example when your friend says do these pants make me look fat the correct answer is no the correct answer is you look great especially if you want to go somewhere right now you know no you look great let's go <laughs> right? um, that's okay to tell a person something that you know my husband made the world's worst mistake when i asked that question one time he goes i don't think it's the pants <laughs> Like, and I was really thin at the time he, he said that, so I didn't take it quite as badly as it might sound, but he, he meant it like, you look the same as you always do. It doesn't matter which pants you're wearing. But I heard it like, you always look fat. These pants are not going to help or harm that. <laughs> oh God, don't say that. That's not, that is not the correct answer is you look great. Let's go. Um, anyway, not all lies are equally bad right? Not all behaviors are bad in, in all circumstances. Sometimes the behavior is bad here and it's maybe marginal over here and it's perfectly fine over there, right? Like we as adults recognize the grayness of moral issues. Children are very black and white and they're like, it is this or it's that. You're either good or you're bad. And if you're a little bit good, you're all good. If you're a little bit bad, you're all bad. Um, whatever, is, um, whatever is most salient to them. Um, heteronymous morality is fundamentally based on the inequality between children and adults so that children know that adults can come in and deprive them of their freedom, for example. So now you have to go sit in time out or can deprive them of their toys or can deprive them of their, um, you know, their friend. Now your friend has to go home or whatever. Um, that basic inequality means that, you know, cause children can't come in and go, you know what, I've had it with you guys, your friend's going home. Like that can't happen. Right. So kids know fundamentally that that they are not equals with adults. And so as a result, they try and behave in ways that will not displease the adults. They want their freedoms, they want their toys, they want their friend over, they want these things. And so they try to behave in a way that will, um, will keep them in good stead with the adults. So heteronymous morality really relies on, you know, adults and their powerfulness for children to be able to make their good moral choices. Um, it, it assumes that the child is not going to be able to 
you know, when left completely their own devices and nobody would know what they've done to necessarily make the good choices. All right, I'm going to stop here because Kohlberg's moral ladder takes a little bit of time. So I will start Kohlberg's moral ladder in the next segment.